Hey everyone, welcome. How's dinner? Pretty good. Can you believe that? Your speeches, dinner, the whole night is ready for you. I'm glad to have you with us tonight. I'm Jason Perry. I'm the director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. So glad you are here tonight. How many of you have been part of this competition before? A couple of you? This is a pretty amazing night. Our winner from last year, raise your hand right there. This is RJ Walker. <laughs> Call him Brick. All right, I'm remembering your speech, the winner from last year, which was amazing. This is the 10th year that we have held the Hip Talks competition here at the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Uh, for those of you doing the math, we're going to give $10,000 away tonight by the time we're done. Can you believe that? That's 90000 so far that we've been given. And it's because of the generosity of the Wayne Owens Fund. I don't know, I, many of you have read, particularly those of you who are connected with the Hinckley Institute of Politics, but Congressman Wayne Owens was a brilliant communicator. He was able to get a message across, able to give a speech that could move the country. That's how good he was. And this is a competition is done in his honor. We're so grateful for him and his, for his family and also for his representative here tonight, Steve Owens. Raise your hand right here in the back. Steve Owens, the family representative who will be, uh, who'll be helping not only to judge tonight, but because of him and his family, we're able to give these scholarships each year. Uh, this year, uh, we have had over 70 speeches given in the preliminary competitions. So we are down to, uh, to the last 28 finalists tonight. This is the best of the best. It's something you're gonna wanna hear. So I'm gonna give you a couple of the ground rules so you can hear them tonight, so you can know. So two minutes, all right? If you go over two minutes, it's gonna start impacting your score from the judges. And we're going to have someone watching. Who's going to be doing the, hold that up right there. You see that right there for everyone giving the speech? Look at that, it's one minute, all right? There's your warning. What's going to come after that? All right, 30 seconds and then time, all right? It's time to end it when you see that, all right? We're going to go in, when we go back to, to judge these speeches, we will have a little notes about how, who went over by how much they went over. So keep it there. 14 speeches first, and then we'll have a break, all right? The judges will go in the back, We'll take a minute, uh, we'll start uh, going through our preliminary assessment, and then we'll come back and do the rest. Follow the schedule that you see in the handout in front of you. When it's your turn, come to the front, grab a mic if you want. This is pretty much your deal, all right? Grab a mic, you can stand here, you can roam. This is your show, all right? Just make it great. That's all we're looking for right there. Uh, everyone should have an audience favorite sheet in front of you. Do you see that? Hold that, make sure you've got one of those. Um, Pictures and titles, as soon as we finish the very last speech, we will collect those. All right, we'll go back. You as the crowd get to pick who you think is the audience uh, favorite. So you'll circle your favorite speech of the night, and we'll do that. Uh, we'll have a grand prize winner, $5,000 scholarship for the grand prize. I mean, I, I'm not the math major. But that's $2,500 a minute. All right? When are you going to make that kind of money your whole life? I mean, it's pretty amazing. So let's get ready. We'll have one grand prize, four runners up, and one audience favorite. All right? This is a big, great night. And see these trophies over here? Also priceless. All right? You're going to want one of those trophies. Really quickly, I want to make sure you know who our judges are tonight. I've introduced a couple. I'll be one of the judges. Uh, Steve Owens, who you've, who you've heard, uh, seen, the president of Epperson and Owens Law Firm, the Owens Family Representative, R.J. Walker, you have met the 2023 grand prize, Sui Lang Pinoke, raise your hand right there, Sui Lang, everyone needs to know her, Senior Vice President of Culture at Zions Bank, also the Utah Women's Run Board, thank you for being part of that, Sui, and Peter Watkins, raise your hand, you've not had a chance to meet him yet, uh, Communications Professor, at the great University of Utah. He worked in the White House Communications Department, has just done a great work, has done great work on speeches. He is a master of great speeches. Uh, also the owner of Watkins Global Strategies. Okay, we're gonna be the five judges tonight. Are we ready to get this thing going? All right, let's do it. Michaela Lear, you here in the house? Okay, you're gonna be first, all right? I'm gonna put the microphone down. Give me a chance to get back to my seat and we'll start it. Nick, anything else? Let's make sure this is loud enough, all right? We need, some, we need some energy right here. All right.
My name is Michaela Lear, and this is Another Man's Treasure. Life is precious. I was two years old when I became a big sister, and my parents' world flipped upside down. I'm really three months old, my little sister was diagnosed with biliary atresia, a condition that develops in infancy in which the bile ducts of the liver remain closed, causing toxic bile to build up like a dammed river. If caught early enough, it can be treated with surgical correction, but unfortunately, the only option for most is a liver transplant or death. Following the diagnosis, my mother does not sleep. She lies awake at the hospital, watching helplessly as her ill child never wakes, too tired to eat or to cry. There are tubes hooked up to machines in the baby's nose and arms. Her skin is full of jaundice. Her bloodshot eyes bulge like balloons. Her stomach swells as though she has swallowed an inflated volleyball. The doctors perform a failed surgery. An organ donation is now the only option, and she's placed at the back of a line that she may never reach the beginning of. They give her one week to live. But at 4 a.m. on a Sunday morning in California, you can hear the cries of a family blindsided by the loss of their five-year-old child. And yet, despite their grief, they choose to pay the gift of life forward. Meanwhile, in Utah, there's a sharp knock of news at the door. There's a liver available, but it comes with a cost. If the surgery also fails, this tiny dear baby would have no liver left and she would die. Family is gathered to say goodbye. She's never known the absence of pain and she maybe never will. She's carted away and the waiting begins. Hours pass. The surgeons work from the evening well into the dead of night and infrequent vague pro updates of progress are periodically announced. Finally, when the gravity of the situation can be bared no longer, the doctors return. Time stops and breath can enter no lungs. Was this the hoped for victory? Or was it merely condolences for the loss of a child that would never know love? But the words tumble from the doctor's mouth in much the same way that words tumble from, the water tumbles from a spigot through a hose on a hot July day. It was relief because the surgery was a success. Life is precious. Sometimes it is a gift we give and sometimes it is a gift we receive. One man's tragedy can be another man's treasure. Hello, I'm James Linton, and this is Communist Cowboys. Technically, most cowboys are not communists. In fact, even the cattle ranchers that I'm going to talk about today would probably not consider themselves communists, and I have nothing against them personally. Their business practices, on the other hand, I have some serious beef with. And I think that wherever you are on the political spectrum, you might think the same thing by the end of this. The businesses that I'm talking about are those that graze cattle on our public lands. You might think that this isn't a big deal, but if you love nature or money, well, it is. The Center for Biological Diversity says that the ecological costs of livestock grazing far exceed that of any other Western land use. And if you spend some time in Utah's beautiful public lands, you'll start to notice pretty quickly where cattle are destroying the environment that our native species depend on. On top of that, less than 2% of the beef that we consume in America actually comes from cattle that was ever grazed on public lands. So we could end this practice tomorrow, and it would have almost zero effect on the food supply. Environmentalists, for a lot of them, this is all it takes to hop on this bandwagon. But I'm not just here for the environmentalists. I've got something for the free market economists in the crowd as well. If you are one of the lucky ranchers with a permit to graze your cattle on public land, it costs you about $1.35 per cattle per month. If you are one of the vast majority of ranchers without these special privileges, you are paying at minimum 20 times that amount. Now you might think, well, if the government's getting money and it's not coming from my taxes, can it really be all that bad? Absolutely it can. In 2015, the Bureau of Land Management reported that they spent over double the cost that they received from grazing fees just administering this specific program. So we as taxpayers are heavily subsidizing this industry that's questionable whether it's really that beneficial at all. In short, thousands of destructive cattle are chewing and shitting their way across our public lands, and we're the ones paying for it. Thank you. My name is Rayshon Baker, <clears throat> and I'll be performing uh, Painting a Picture for You. Allow me to paint a picture for you. Oppressed and blue, caught in chains of silence, but unable to flee. Invisible shackles, a reality you can't see. I want you to imagine that you are me. 
When every day is a tragedy and the boys in blue don't seem to root for you, it begins to make you wonder, what could I really do? Allow me to paint a picture for you. If you could walk a mile in my footsteps, you'd find that the soles have already been worn out from the shoes. And to think that you could experience one-tenth, or I'm sorry, three-fifths of what I feel is foolish to say the least. See, because you think you could be me, but you don't understand because you can't see me the way society sees me. Come closer. I'm speaking, but I'm not just talking. And you're listening, but you're not hearing me. Can you see what I see? Can you see the picture I paint? They say beauty lies within the eye of the beholder, but beauty takes a different turn when you see life through the eyes of a black man. That just like Langston Hughes, I too hear America singing, just in a different tone, because I am the darker brother, the lesser known. They say that Martin Luther King had a dream, but it's hard to dream when your feet are planted. So yes, take my soulless shoes, the only possession I own. Are you soulless too? Allow me to drift off like a flower petal in the night sky. And hopefully when I land, his dream will have come true for me and for you. And where am I? I'm right here, painting a picture for you, oppressed and blue. Have you imagined that you are me? Thank you. My name is Luke Larson, and this is I Will. Growing up, I jumped with my eyes wide open, and I started to imagine the life that I could create for myself. Early on, I knew I wanted to make a difference, and I knew gaining an education and going to school was how I was going to give that to myself and to other people. I remember how innocent school used to be, but I remember when I became scared of it. I still remember the names I was called and the group of boys who waited for me outside of class. I remember the fear of walking into the building every morning, <laughs> and I didn't even know what the word gay meant, and I still remember the threats from those boys because they consumed me. A decade later, and I had to grow up a lot faster than I thought, and now I'm stepping into a society of careers that are still heteronormative and male-dominated. Four out of five LGBTQ adults take at least one action to avoid experiencing discrimination, and that includes hiding their romantic relationship. <laughs> that same culture I've dreamt of escaping and just to dive right back into it. But what if we could change it? Education is essential to learning, and visibility creates understanding. By embracing education about sexual orientation and gender identity, we can challenge our current social pattern and create more awareness. We need to foster environments where authenticity can be celebrated, not suppressed. And education is the key. My community dies every day due to hate from others around them. And <laughs> it's... <laughs> and we need to... <laughs> I'm sorry. So, for the boy who grew up wanting to do more and be something more than the world seems to want to let him, I'm not going to ask for acceptance or respect ever again. I'm going to demand it. I will. Thank you. My name is Nevaeh Parker, and this is Front Row Seats. I was an optimistic kid, wouldn't let anyone get rid of the thoughts in my brain that the world was my oyster. You see, as a kid, my view was skewed, never knew what happened in the news. So as soon as I started scrolling on a phone, the world I saw in the palm of my hands built an anger inside that was long overdue. From hate crimes being televised, to police brutality, to genocide. From hearing mothers' cries, to watching children 
starve before our eyes. We have all had front row seats to tragedy for quite some time. But what does that mean? Where does that leave us? Who are we to not fight back centuries of oppression that keep killing the innocent in the name of justice, in the name of self-defense, in the name of some kind of superiority complex? Where is the light at the end of the tunnel? The final scene? The happily ever after? Because when I scroll through my phone, I don't feel laughter. I see people who look just like me, my brother, my sister, only it's too late for them to speak and say, have mercy. I am human, just like you. I have a family. I don't have a gun. I want to go home. Officer, please let me go home. Advocacy can be some sort of simplicity. You don't have to stand on a stage in order to advocate, but you must speak up when you witness hate. And if you don't know when to speak up, take a look within. Do not comply. If you can get by, help another man try. Times are uncertain. But one thing holds true. I still have my voice and can use it. And the same goes for you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Catherine Riley, and the title of my speech is Let's Take a Look at What Happened Here. Six lives were tragically lost after the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland. As a civil engineering major here at the U, the aspects surrounding the collapse immediately grabbed my attention. Why did the bridge come falling down the way it did? Was there anything that could have been done to prevent it? The bridge stood for 47 years and was constructed as a three-span, continuous arch truss bridge. While ultimately the bridge failed due to vessel collision, the aspects surrounding its design played a major role in its ultimate downfall. The continuous nature meant that when the bridge lost its main support, the two adjacent spans immediately came falling down with it. This is due that, to the fact that the bridge was designed to act as one, continuous span, not in isolation. In 1991, vessel collision was introduced as a specification for bridge design. However, design for the Francis Scott Key Bridge began in the 1960s. Although the bridge was technically up to code and had even passed a recent maintenance inspection, this one design factor led to the loss of lives and the shutdown of a major port for the transportation of goods. I chose to pursue civil engineering as my career to ensure that public safety is at the forefront of infrastructure design. I am hopeful for a career where one day my colleagues and I can prevent tragedies like the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sadie Anderson Fernandez, and this is titled An Apple a Day. I place an apple in my backpack in case I get hungry, knowing full well that at 11.53 a.m. my stomach will rumble and that the mental debate of whether I've earned the apple yet will burn enough calories for me to eat seven apples without gaining a pound. But the weight of waiting weighs on my mind. The hunger in my stomach stings, and I know that not even water can drown it out. An apple might, but even a bite suggests I've lost the battle. I should just throw it out the window so I'll stop thinking about it. But I work on the fifth floor, and an apple thrown from that height with such frustration could kill a man. Or worse, I could pass it on my walk to the car and eat it, bruised skin blaring its victory in my face. I pull the apple out of my backpack and the fruit shiny surface demands my attention. It grows heavier by the minute. When I was 19 years old, I thought the beauty meant taking up as little space as possible. My physical appearance consumed me and I based my worth on an arbitrary number on a scale that my mind decided was good enough. It was never good enough. 
but eventually I reached a breaking point. Brittle and battered by my poor treatment, bruised by a distorted body image, my body stopped cooperating. An apple a day won't keep the doctor away if it's all you eat. My body didn't want to be any smaller. She demanded to be seen, to be heard. I'm 24 years old, and while my journey to self-love has been far from perfect, over these five years of peaks and valleys, I've learned that our bodies are beautiful. We shouldn't be ashamed to take up space, to fill a room, to make our clothes fit us instead of forcing our bodies into clothes, forcing ourselves to conform to the perceived expectations of those around us. Our bodies are capable of climbing mountains, dancing in the rain, trying new foods. They're the conduit through which we experience the world. So stretch yourselves, expand yourselves, and don't be afraid to grow. Thank you. My name is London Kelly, and my speech is titled, A Step Towards Safety. Prostitution is one of the world's oldest careers. Dating back to ancient Greece and Israel, medieval England and France, today it is a multi-billion dollar industry, and most of that money comes from countries where it is illegal. The United States alone contributes over $14 billion annually. So that raises the question, should prostitution be legalized? Opponents of this cite human trafficking and human rights concerns. And it is true, over 50% of human trafficking can be tied back to sexual slavery. And some studies have shown that in countries with legalized prostitution, the reported rates of human trafficking is higher. But the key word being reported rates. It's entirely possible, and perhaps even plausible, that only the reported rates are higher, not the actual rates. With legalization comes governmental oversight. And this may make victims more willing to go to the police because they themselves have no longer committed a crime. Prostitution is also a highly dangerous career, and sex workers face an increased race of abuse and rape, many of which go unreported because they fear the police. The Netherlands legalized prostitution because they recognize it is a career and an industry that is not going away, but there are ways to make it safer. I don't expect that of the United States, but a good first step would be decriminalization. This would allow victims of abuse and rape, both those that have been trafficked and those who have chosen the career, to more willingly and freely go to the police and report this, as they no longer fear criminal charges. And I believe that this will make not only their lives safer, but all of our lives safer. And it's time to stop, stop shaming and criminalizing people just for doing what they can to survive. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Hannah Duffy, and today I will be giving my speech called Birth Control, Full Disclosure. My conversation with my doctor about birth control went like this. Hey doc, what's the most effective thing you've got? She gave me my list of options and their risks of pregnancy. Ultimately, I chose to get a small bar in my arm, mostly because it was nearly 100% effective. For years, I didn't think much about that small bar. It wasn't until I started thinking about having kids of my own that I started to question my birth control drugs. Here I was buying organic fruits and veggies while also dosing myself with hormones. It didn't fit. So I came off birth control and I developed cystic acne, rashes, GI issues, and debilitating period cramps. Like any good scientist, I dove headfirst into books and articles just to figure out what had happened. What I learned about the female menstrual cycle empowered me. I learned how to track my ovulation using my cervical fluid and my body temperature. I learned how to biohack my cycle to more effectively study, exercise, and even build relationships. Finally, I used proper nutrition to reduce my period cramps to the point where I don't buy ibuprofen. This has been a literal healing period. Birth control doesn't just change ovaries and vaginas. It fundamentally impacts every organ in our bodies. It rewires our brain, changes our microbiome, and puts us at higher risk of developing health conditions such as blood clots, depression, and cancer, to name a few. My plea to every menstruating person here today 
is that you educate yourself on your physiology. To my doctor, I ask this question. Shouldn't birth control be explained in terms of how it works instead of just how well it works? It is time for women everywhere to receive the sex education they deserve, beginning with birth control. Thank you. Hello, my name is Gray Adela, and my speech is entitled Black, White, and Gray. I'm half black, I'm half white, and my name is Gray. Now, I'm not playing with y'all, my legal name is Gray, however, I was named after my southern white grandfathers, it's purely coincidental, but let's talk about it. Growing up black-ish in Utah can be an interesting thing to navigate. Like, take the three black people that you know, chances are we cousins, or we see each other each year at Juneteenth and celebrate. Now, we may not be huge in number, but we sure are popular. Like when somebody says, dude, I can't be racist, I have black friends. I'm that black friend. And uh, not to mention, if anything even remotely race-related gets brought up in my work environment, I'm all of a sudden boosted to the chair of the NAACP and consulted on further action. Now, dating in Utah can be a thing. Like, white girls, I'm not here for your fetishized dream to get a quarter black baby, all right? I mean, even if we did have a kid, we couldn't even name it Gray. I mean, if we follow my parents' model, we'd have to name it Off-White, and let's not do that to the poor kid. I mean, I get it, I'm black enough that you can tell your friends, I'm dating a black guy, but just white enough that your dad won't be too embarrassed to talk about me to your racist uncle at the family Thanksgiving dinner. Also, I'm always prepared for that one liberal aunt to pull me aside to let me know that she voted for Obama. Twice. <laughs> now, honestly, in a time where it feels like everybody wants us to pick a side, being biracial can leave you wondering where you fit in. Growing up, I was called half-breed, African, Oreo, yellow, but my mama would always tell me, baby, you are the best of both worlds. I am living proof of two people who didn't give in to the fear of society and how they would react, nonetheless their own families. I'm living proof that the love between two people is 10 times stronger than fear. And lastly, I'm living proof that just because I'm black doesn't mean I pray to Barack Obama and just because I'm white doesn't mean I long to make love to Donald Trump. <laughs> Simply put, my name is Gray, I'm Gray, and that's kind of perfect. Thanks, mom and dad. My name is Caleb Martin. This is Dear Grandma, Dear Grandpa. Dear Grandma, Dear Grandpa, for a long time I didn't tell you because I was ashamed. I love you both and I didn't want to disappoint you. Then for so long I didn't say anything because I felt like it shouldn't matter. I thought I'm still the same person as before. Why should I have to make some sort of big declaration? Then for so long I didn't say anything because it was just easier not to. As a kid, my whole future was laid out for me. Serving a mission, marriage in the temple, lifelong church leadership, maybe even a spot in the bishopric, just like dad and just like you, grandpa. The church was my family, my community, my classmates, my home. That's why it was so hard. I hated myself. I still remember the exact moment I knew the church had no place in my life. I was having a conversation with the stake president, and I asked him, even if gay church members live a life of celibacy, even if they follow every commandment, how can they reach exaltation in the celestial kingdom when the church says that that requires being sealed in the temple? He responded, that's easy. After you die, your homosexuality will be removed from you, just like any other disability. I tell you all this now because I had to before I could share my joy with you. My joy. His name is Liam. He brings me soup when I am sick. I feel the furnace within every kiss and the love that burns within my heart is more powerful than any I found within chapel walls. I love my God, the God who lives inside me, who lives inside all of us. I am not disabled. I am perfect and whole just as God made me. I love you both. I miss you. And I am no longer ashamed. Eternally yours, your grandson, Caleb. I'm Samantha Watron, and this is I Keep Forgetting. I keep forgetting. When I was in high school, I never forgot. When there's Confederate flags in your school parking lot, when you get called the Essler when you walk down the hallway, and when you're on your third conversation of the day with your 
white classmate explaining why no, you actually can't say the N-word. It makes it impossible to forget. But then I came to the U. Suddenly, I wasn't spending my time explaining why white people couldn't say the N-word, but rather discussing how the Barbie movie isn't man-hating propaganda, but it is feminist 101 garbage that's too simple for us. Suddenly, Joe Biden is not the woke agenda, but rather too conservative of a politician to vote for. This makes it easy to forget. Us forgetting, us living in our privileged leftist utopia, allows us to forget that just miles away from this campus, lawmakers criminalize transgender people simply for using the bathroom that matched their gender identity. Let's us forget that Utah is leading the charge on banning diversity, equity, and inclusion programs across the country. When we forget, when we demonize marginal change in favor of the radical, we don't do anything. Because while we're too busy discussing how Marxist theory is the best way to overthrow the US government, politicians don't care. Because they're too busy making harmful policy. While we demonize TikTok feminism for not being a sophisticated integration of the leftist literature, a little girl's only exposure to feminism is coming from her For You page. We forget that the real world does not look like our lecture halls. And while we sit in our ivory tower and oppose progress for not being progressive enough, others do not have the privilege of forgetting. Hello everyone, my name is Riley Hertzberg and I am here to speak on the hypocrisy of censorship. A call for censorship is the call of a hypocrite. When an individual uses their voice to express themselves but then subsequently requests, if not demands, that someone else abstain from doing so themselves, they are guilty of hypocrisy. Alarmingly, such a call not only demonstrates doubt in, but the dismantling of critical thought, which is rather ironic given the lack of critical thought on the part of the hypocrite. You see, each of us have the ability to hear a wide array of ideas and decide for ourselves, in accordance with our personal values, what ideas we will support. We don't need someone, some sort of authority on the basis of their title or reputation to define truth. If we did look to someone with their personal biases and perhaps schemes to decide truth and disseminate right, then at what point are we not under a clear dictatorship? Accordingly, it is my sincerely held belief that we need diverse attitudes in our discussions. You see, by supporting someone else's freedom of speech, you are not supporting their ideas. What you are doing is putting a vote in your favor, a vote to hear attitudes of, of diverse individuals and then to subsequently voice your own. Now, of course, you may sometimes wonder, how does someone come to conclusions that they do and rightfully or wrongfully determine that their ideas are from a place of hate or idiocy? Not to say those are exclusive. Bottom line being, though, is that by justifying someone else's censorship, you are opening the door for the tables to be turned on you, for you to be silenced, for you to be the one who's misunderstood and misrepresented. It is my belief that genuine advocates of truth will purposefully include all attitudes in their discussions. What matters to me at the end of the day is that you can hear both my voice as well as the call of the insecure and insensitive hypocrite and then decide what call you yourself will cry. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sydney Kowalski, and this is called A Moment for the Addicts. Sitting face to face with the heroin addict for the first time was not what I expected. I recently began work as an intern therapist at a substance abuse treatment facility. I anticipated working with drug addicts, people with severe mental health, and ex-prisoners, and most of what I knew about these topics came from the media, which portrays drug addicts and prisoners as reckless, scary, and reprehensible. It's safe to say I was not prepared for the stark awakening that would soon come. 
In education classes and in the field working with children, we hear stories of households hurting from substance use. S saving children from these situations is often defined by placing them in foster care or by parents receiving jail sentences as if separating families is a success. At my internship, I've seen stories from families Getting help for these children. In getting help for these children, one question is frequently neglected. What about the parents? What about the mother or father bound by the ties of addiction beyond their control? That, yeah. I'm sorry guys, thank you. Okay, I'm not giving a speech. Let's have a round of applause for that first half of speeches. Those were amazing. We're gonna take about a 15 to 20 minute break to let our judges talk about those first half and we'll come back in here at seven to hear the next 14. Please grab more food if you're hungry. And yeah, we'll see you guys back here at seven. You guys are doing great. Hey, I think this is gonna be good. And you remind me of your name, you're Guy? guy? No. Yes. All right. Thanks for being here. Yes. I will uh, get you mic'd up as soon as I can. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Someone else can come up here. Yeah, we're gonna give you a mic in a moment. Okay, so. all right. I'll just be right here. Sounds good. Yes. So, I've seen you. I'm just going to go. Right.
So I'm just gonna. Okay, testing, testing. Yeah, it works. Uh, pretty good.
so. The two other mics are ready to go. Okay, sir. All right, everybody, we are going to get back to it. So if everyone can take their seats. All right, we're going to hear from our next speaker. So I think Javier is next. My name is Javier Tejeda, and this is louder than likes. <clears throat> a wise man once said, a well done is better than a well said. That man went on to invent several creations such as a lightning rod. Notice how after the quote, nobody recognized him, but the moment I said what he did, most of us recognized him. I didn't have to say a name, but the actions of Benjamin Franklin stuck to us more than his words because what he did impacted generations after him. There's a difference, however, in believing you made a change and actually making a change. See, change involves you doing something. It's the key difference that defines advocacy or slacktivism. Protests and movements are the collective voices of people who want to be listened to. The issue is when this attention is hijacked by people who believe they're making a change to educate or raise awareness. Social media has made this process worse by expanding the amount of people who want the respect from the movement as opposed to giving the respect to the movement. What happens then is these movements aren't given the respect they deserve, leaving us surprised, wondering why the same things are happening over and over again. For the average college student, advocacy comes in the form of posting stories and infographics. So why haven't we seen change? Minimizing our suffering to an iPhone screen simplifies our story to those who think they can do whatever they want, making resistance easy to destroy. So it's time to make a choice. Make a committed effort to change. Donate your time and or money to a cause that you care about or get out of the way. We don't need awareness. Awareness won't fix an action. A message is only as strong as the actions behind it. So remember, folks. We might be valid for the things that we say, but we will be remembered for the things that we do. So what's your lightning rod? Thank you. My name is Emma Taggart, and my speech is Hate to Love. There is no hate like Christian love. This is a phrase commonly used to describe a Christian person who is trying to be loving and supportive, but is unknowingly being dismissive and othering. I felt a lot of this Christian love when I was leaving my Christian religion. And after I left my religion and I came out as queer, I was so hopeful that I'd feel genuine love in the queer community. And in a lot of ways, I did. I was able to comfortably be who I am and continue to explore who I want to be. However, I also started to notice a lot of this Christian love in the queer community. In order to be in the queer community, it wasn't enough just to be queer. You had to be the right kind of queer. You had to hold certain political beliefs. You had to be friends with a certain type of person. And you had to be a social justice warrior who was educated on every single problem going on in the world. But if you ask questions about current events, especially if it's related to queer issues or queer history, some people would ridicule and shame you. I saw this especially happen to a lot of my friends and family that aren't a part of the queer community. But in reality, isn't this acceptance and understanding exactly what the queer community, Christians, and really all of us want? We all want our identities and communities to be understood and accepted and yet it's the culture of these same communities that others people who don't fit their mold. They other the exact people that we want to have understand us. So if we want to be understood and accepted, we need to create communities that are understanding and accepting to those different from us. Otherwise, our hate is never going to be love and passion. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Max Lepore, and this speech is titled, Why We Need Working Class Representation. America is a country that claims to strive for equality for all. And while we have made some progress in increasing the representation of both women and racial and ethnic minorities in Congress in recent years, we have failed to do so for our country's working class. According to data from political scientist Nicholas Carnes, the working class has made up more than half of our country since the start of the 20th century, but consistently less than 2% of Congress. And on the flip side, despite making up less than 9% of our country's population today, millionaires hold a majority in Congress. This under and over representation matters. According to work done by Carnes, as well as research that I have done in furtherance of his work, we have both found that working class members of Congress tend to vote on economic issues in ways that better coincide with the general views of the working class. By having this perspective, these members of Congress are best able to represent the working class. However, these members also find their bills to be killed off at extraordinarily high rates because a lack of working class support leads to a lack of working class focused outcomes, which leads to negative effects on our working class. Just one of the many examples of this is the fact that despite passing tax cuts for other income groups recently, not once in my lifetime has Congress passed a tax cut for Americans in the lowest income tax bracket. With all this in mind, it should come to no one's surprise that Americans with lower incomes are more likely to distrust our government and congressional approval ratings are currently at historic lows. However, research has found that increasing representation for historically underrepresented groups helps members of those groups to see democratic representation and decision making as more legitimate. As such, we need to elect more working class candidates to Congress. Not only will this ensure that our Congress takes action to improve the lives of working class Americans, but it'll also improve the dismal views that everyday Americans feel toward our government. For a country that claims to strive for equality for all, we face a choice. We can continue to elect an exclusive government that serves the rich and elite, or we can start to elect a representative government that serves all Americans. We must make the right choice. Thank you. Hi, my name is Taylor Calabresi, and this is Research, Research, Research. How to tell if you're still in love. How to tell if you're an abusive person. Signs your boyfriend is abusive. Signs you should break up. This speech may sound like it's going to be about a terrible relationship, but rest assured, it was healthy and no abuse took place. Nope, this was just a regular Thursday night for me in 2020, repeatedly Googling, reading the same articles over and over again, hoping to alleviate any anxiety. About a year later, I had a conversation that changed my life. I was driving home with a friend when I ran over a blanket in the road. I was trying to listen to her tell a story, but I couldn't help but keep looking back until eventually I blurted out, that wasn't a kid I hit, right? And she said no, but a familiar panic still radiated through me. It's okay, I told myself. I'll just check the news later per usual, and maybe she can relate. So I asked, do you also check the news every day to make sure you weren't unknowingly involved in a hit and run and make sure your car doesn't match the descriptions listed in KSL articles? And she said, um, nope, that sounds like OCD. I immediately discredited this. I thought people with obsessive compulsive disorder were obsessed with cleaning or counting, and I definitely didn't have that. Sure, I worried that any tingling sensation in my hand meant that I had ALS, that I was going to prison for life despite having a clean record, that I had to put my hair clip in 20 times to confirm I was losing all of my hair, that in high school I was pregnant even though I was a virgin, that my day, my life, my world would come crumbling down if I didn't research or analyze each of these thoughts. Well, after further consideration and doing more research, my favorite, I visited a psychologist who diagnosed me with OCD. This made me wonder though, how many people live with undiagnosed OCD because of the vast misconceptions that exist? At least once per week I hear someone say they're so OCD because they like to keep things tidy. In reality, OCD looks so different in so many people, and I hope others like me can have the opportunity to experience how life-changing a proper diagnosis and treatment can be. So please help spread the word and repeat with me. OCD is not synonymous with cleaning. OCD is not synonymous with cleaning. OCD is not synonymous with cleaning. Thank you. Hello, my name is Shun Sang, and this is the story of a boy. Once upon a time, a boy was born in a place known as North Korea. He grew up without knowing what it is like to be free. When his uncle got arrested and tortured 
for watching a South Korean TV show. He just assumed that this is the way things are. Just like that, he lived on, thinking everything around him was just normal. Until one day, a great starvation struck his village, and there was only one choice left for him. To sit down, waiting for death, or attempting an escape, risking his life. He chose to escape. At the end of a painful journey, he managed to get to South Korea. He was one of the few people who were extremely lucky enough to escape from the North Korea and start a new life. But this is not his story. There was another boy who was born not so far away from where the other boy was born. The only thing that changed his fate so drastically was the fact that he was born about 100 miles down south. He grew up without knowing what it is like to be oppressed. He lived on thinking everything around him was just normal until one day he met a friend from North and heard his story. He had always known the situation of North Koreans, but there was a huge difference between just knowing and understanding. And that difference turned his life upside down. He stopped taking what he had for granted, for now he understands the desperation of those who would risk their lives for something he had always had, a freedom. And he decided that he's going to take a step further from there and devote his life for those who's living without the nourish of freedom. For now he understands that even his own freedom was given to him by those who lived before him and devoted their lives to it. So he decided that he's going to do the same. That boy is me, and this is my story. Thank you. My name is Fitzgerald Adams, and this speech is called Live, Laugh, Love. 48,183. In the US in 2021, 48,183 people died. Not from war, not from disease, not even from the hands of another, but their own suicide. On top of that, according to the CDC, that same year, 1.7 million people attempted to take their own lives, and 3.5 million had a date and a plan, and 12.3 million people seriously considered it. I've been a part of that statistic. When I was younger, I believed that my life didn't matter and that I had no purpose. I used to have a page in a notebook where I'd write down every single negative intrusive thought my brain could conjure up, leading to a cesspool and pileup of the most negative and hateful and toxic messages and words, all directed towards the hand writing them. You're worthless, you're not enough, you'll never be enough. No one wants you, no one loves you. Why are you still here? Why are you not dead? <sighs> I didn't know. Like so many others, I believed that in order to be wanted, in order to be missed, in order to be loved, in order to have a positive impact on the world, I had to die, to remove myself, become a non-entity. The page would try to convince me of all of these things, but it's wrong. It's the complete opposite, actually. We don't need to die to be wanted or missed, to be loved, to have a positive impact on the world. It's the exact opposite. We need to live, to laugh, to love. Suburban wine moms had it right all along. <laughs> Many of you believe this as I did, but please, do not cut that life off prematurely. Do not remove any chance of something positive coming from that life before it can happen. Please, I beg of you, do not let your page convince you that you are worthless and not deserving of life because it is wrong. My page is gone, but I still have the ashes. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name's Will Rosansky. I was born and raised in Montana to proud union parents, and this is a story about where I come from, titled The Ballad of Frank Little by Dusty the Kid. The sun rose over Homestake in the early morning fog, and a man got off a train bound straight for glory. 
With a red card in his pocket and a fire in his eye, Frank Little was his name, and here's his story. To the town of Butte, Montana, where they worked down in the mines, trading waking hours for blood, sweat, and sorrow. Digging copper for the bosses that would throw us naught but dimes and praying that we'd see the sun tomorrow. Just two weeks ago, a thousand feet beneath the ground, 200 men burned alongside their brothers. Against the doorless bulkheads of the speculator mine, they probably died calling for their mothers. Frank Little walked into the town and made his reason known. He's a wobbly that has been sent from Chicago. He's organized the workers from the mountains to the sea, and he's here to fight for you and fight for me. From the lumber camps of Missoula to the quarries of Spokane to the oil fields and the dock boys of Wisconsin, even the migrant workers on the California farms, he organized and inspired his fellow man. Frank Little stood with us through the beatings of the company's hired men until the picket line stretched on 100,000. Side by side, we made a promise that we would not be slaves again, deafening the bosses with our howling. In the early August morning, they kicked in Frankie's door and drug him naked out into the street. Those yellow bastards tortured him, company men and Pinkertons. They tied him up and knocked him off his feet. The sun rose over Homestake in the early morning fog and a mountain wind went whistling through the trees. Frank Little swung there gently from the Milwaukee Bridge with a noose round his neck and blood running down his knees. Now, they thought they'd break the strike if they took Frank Little's life, but the company was gravely mistaken. From Haymarket to Montana is a sea of red bandanas, and the breath of revolution can't be taken. You can't give up this fight. Hold the picket line tonight. Workers of the world, strike, strike, strike. From a young age, my father told me to get good grades, said I must go to college without his aid. At home, my emotions didn't matter, felt like I couldn't speak. If I brought home A's on my report card, it might be a good week. Blood down my mom's face from just one hit. I begged and begged, he wouldn't quit. Swore I would never end up with someone like that. I wanted freedom and not to feel trapped. So I went off to school at just 17, worked all I could with student loans in between. After I graduated, I thought I found the one. I got married and was happy. Our new life had just begun. But after four months of marriage and a baby on the way, I realized he was like my dad. But then my husband, he ran away. So I returned to the U for a graduate degree had to quit my job to be with my baby. Now, back on the job hunt with rent higher than before, not to mention Utah's childcare has wait lists galore. The cost of quality childcare is also absurd. With inflation sky high, let our voices be heard. Let's teach emotional intelligence in schools for kids like me, whose parents aren't available so we grew up on a TV. Emotional intelligence is what I want my Ezra to learn. It's what will help him in the future be able to discern. Too bad Utah's curriculums aren't built with emotional intelligence in mind. In 2019, there were 98,000 kids left behind. Now, after seven months of job rejections, I want to give up. Is it because I'm a woman or just not enough? With rent almost due and no money to pay, my brain is consumed how we'll survive another day. I went to college but can't keep a roof overhead. Should I have listened to them? Go to school is what they said. Testing, testing, we're good? All right. Hello everyone, my name is Talha, and my speech is titled, A Call for Peace. Imagine you were a mother, and for years you kept on trying to conceive a child, until suddenly, one day, you get two twins, born. So precious, so beautiful, you hold them in your lap until suddenly what happens is an airstrike comes out of nowhere and kills your twins and your husband. This is no other than the case of a Palestinian mother who lost her entire family to an Israeli airstrike. 
but her faith in God is what kept her and many other Palestinians strong, no matter what they went through. Now let's go to another scenario. Imagine you go to the festival with your friends, just with the boys, just another day out, and suddenly what happens is terrorists come out of nowhere, shooting everyone down, bang, 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 everyone around you is dead on the floor. And this is what we saw on October 7th, with Hamas terrorizing Israelis. Now even though both scenarios are different by name, they share one thing in common, and that is that they both stem from enmity. And when enmity grows, it becomes this disgusting plant that makes even the most beautifulest of nations the worst of sights. And the biggest example of that is that there are more than 33,000 innocent civilians killed, and majority of them are Palestinian, according to AP News. Now you might be thinking to yourself as an American, why should I care about this? Well, instead of our government spending our tax money on something useful in this country, they decide to spend $14.5 billion to try to eradicate Hamas, and more than tens of thousands of innocent civilians have died, 1.1 million Palestinians in food insecurity, and Hamas has still not been eradicated. Would you really want your tax money to be put in a genocide that doesn't even benefit you at all? If you say no, then demand the government to stop sending arms to Israel. This is so that Israeli power can decentralize, and afterwards, Palestinians can live in their land peacefully without any type of violence. Then we can talk about hostages being released, and finally, a permanent ceasefire. This comes back to Malcolm X, as he says, that no one can be at peace unless he has his freedom. Thank you. I'm Rebecca, and this is Only the Wealthy Survive. I'm 22 years old, and I am nearly six figures in medical debt. That number will only continue to cry, climb as a transplant patient, cancer survivor, and a chronically ill American citizen. This story rings true for some Americans all over the country. The 2021 US Census found that 20% of families are facing medical debt, while 50% of bankruptcies in this country are tied to medical issues. Similarly, in every transplant center in this nation, it is required that you have to prove that you are able to pay before you receive an organ. That's ranging from $400,000 for a kidney to a whopping $1.3 million for a heart. I know it sounds hard to believe, but it happened to me here at the University of Utah Hospital. They said, you have to prove you can pay for this. And if we can't, then she dies. That was it. This story it's not as prevalent for the average able-bodied American as it's not as realistic in your lives. However, all it takes is one accident for you to not only wake up without your previous abilities, but with your pockets completely and literally dried, you will wake up with absolutely nothing. The United States government has not only a responsibility, but a moral duty to protect its American citizens, every single one of them, despite adversities. And I speak for millions of Americans when I say that I do not and I never have felt protected. Not only that, but we hear so often that people, that every person in this country has the, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. However, as we hang extraordinary medical bills over the chronically ill's heads, we are passively removing those God-given and unalienable rights every single day. Because I have to pay to survive and to stand here today, every month. And the rest of you likely don't. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jaden Bassett, and this is Human or AI. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to confront a stark reality. Artificial intelligence is taking over our lives at an alarming rate. It's not just about convenience anymore. It's about the erosion of our fundamental rights and values. First and foremost, let's talk about privacy. AI algorithms are constantly gathering data about us, whether we realize it or not. From our online activity to our physical movements tracked by surveillance cameras, our privacy is being compromised on a massive scale. And who's to say where this data all ends up? Corporations, governments, or even malicious institutions could exploit it for their own gain, 
leaving us vulnerable and exposed. But it doesn't stop there. Fake news and misinformation spread like wildfire thanks to AI-powered algorithms that tailor content to manipulate our beliefs and decisions. Deep fake technology allows anyone with a computer to create convincing videos of other people saying and doing things they never actually did. This not only undermines our faith in media and institutions, but also has the potential to wreak havoc on people's individual lives. And let's not forget about academic integrity. With the rise of AI, plagiarism and cheating have become more rampant than ever. Students can easily use AI-generated content to pass off as their own work, undermining the very foundation of education and meritocracy. Now, with all that being said, can I get a raise of hands of people who think that this speech could have been generated with AI? Interesting. Who thinks that I actually wrote this speech? I'm offended. <laughs> as we can see, with the rise of AI, it becomes increasingly difficult for us to be able to distinguish the difference between what is AI and what is human. And that, my friends, is humanity's next challenge and raises some interesting questions about our future. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Guy Kelly, and I entitled this talk uh, Perfecting Your Personal Algorithm. Why is it when some people win the lottery they can't hold on to it? And what would happen if Jeff Bezos or Oprah Winfrey or Justice Sotomayor lost all their success? While they might not be able to replicate the same level of success, they would still be successful. Why? Because of their personal algorithm. What is a personal algorithm? A personal algorithm is our internal decision-making process. Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor, famously taught that between stimulus and response, there's a gap. And in that gap is our ability to choose, or our decision-making process, or our personal algorithm. A simple example to illustrate this concept would be driving down the road, getting cut off in traffic, and becoming angry. Getting cut off would be the stimulus, getting angry would be the response. But the decision to get angry is our personal algorithmic process. Two areas of algorithmic change that we can improve upon are algorithmic inefficiencies and algorithmic defects. An inefficiency, for example, would be identifying that we learn better in the morning. So instead of studying at night, we choose to wake up early and study in the morning. An algorithmic defect would be having a problem telling little white lies. And after reflection, we decide that not putting ourselves in a situation where we'd have to lie is the best way to avoid lying. Focusing on perfecting our personal algorithms is empowering because it puts the focus on that which we have the greatest control over, ourselves. We are not defined by our environmental conditions, our genetic predispositions. And because principles of success are universal, as we make these small, incremental, but important changes to our algorithm, we realize that our success becomes inevitable and our ability to succeed becomes unlimited. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kushi Saini and my speech is called Caged. Marsha Powell was a woman who, after years and years of hell, of being forced into prostitution, being homeless, being practically a slave to a biker gang, and being addicted to various substances, was finally able to gain some stability. She settled down with a man that she loved, was raising a child, and managed to stop the drug use. However, one day, Marsha made the mistake of crossing back into her home state of Arizona, where she was arrested for having an outstanding warrant for possession of 1.5 grams of marijuana. Her stability was shattered. From then, Marsha would continue to have various stints in and out of prison due to her returning drug use, eventually being placed into solitary confinement where she could be heard saying, please, I don't want to be alone. I just want a friend. I just want someone I can talk to. The guards, laughing at her, took her to an outdoor cell in the Arizona desert heat. And they continued to laugh as she screamed and cried while laying in a pile of her own waste. And they continued to laugh as she went silent because she got cooked alive in that heat. Addicts are dehumanized 
in this country. She died not as Marsha Powell, a woman and a mother and a wife, but as prisoner number 109416, just another number. Like so many other numbers, so many other lives that have faced similar atrocities because of our prison system. We need to create a system, create a culture where addicts are not dehumanized and can get the help that they need to build stable lives, like the one that Marsha Powell momentarily had before it was so cruelly taken from her by the injustices of our prison system. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Maddie Hare and this speech is called More to Life. For a long time, my happiness was completely derived from accomplishment. I was constantly thinking, I'll be happy when I get this internship, when I get straight A's, when I finish with four majors, when I go to grad school and have a perfect career, and so on. But playing the I'll be happy when game is one in which we will all lose. Because being perfect on paper means nothing when we're letting valuable time pass without substance. The time to be happy is now. Last summer, my mom had a double lung transplant after suffering from a rare lung disease for many years. I got a phone call at 2 a.m. and immediately flew across the country to see her intubated on a hospital bed. She had six chest tubes and an incision from here to here. Her skin was gray and swollen, her eyes were yellow, and she looked like she was about gone. And after a long and difficult recovery, it appears she has made it. But we never know how many memories we will get with our loved ones. That experience was excruciating and transformative. It taught me that there is much more to life than who we are on paper. So now I define success as what makes me happy when I'm alone with my thoughts. It's not trying to be the most perfect person in the room. It's the memories and relationships I have. It's being proud of my character when I look in the mirror. No one looks at your LinkedIn when you die. They look at photos and reminisce on the way that you made them feel. My mom taught me that. So I've learned to give a lot more time to people that I care about, and I'm not waiting for another accomplishment to make me happy. We all deserve to enjoy where we are right now because we never know how many memories we'll get. Thank you. All right, one last round of applause for all of the speeches tonight. Those were amazing. And now our judges are somehow gonna try and decide the winners. So we're gonna take about a 15, 20 minute break for them to deliberate. We'll see how long it takes them to, to narrow it down. Okay, I need everybody to take your audience award sheet, circle your favorite, pass those to the ends of the row, and somebody from our staff will pick those up. All right? And I got some pens. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just throw this on the on the thing here. Great yeah, job. Yeah, yeah, Worked no great. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Honestly, no worries.
All right, now's your last chance to give your ballots to one of our staff members uh, so tabulation can begin. So if you haven't finished, please do it now.
How are y'all doing? Yeah, what a night, what a night. I was informed it took us too long, but how could it not take us a long time? How's that, Morgan Lancati? It was impossible. I can't even believe what we just had to go through today. This was a good look at uh, some amazing speeches today. So how we're going to do it is I'm going to talk, get the audience favorite, the runners up, and then Steve Owens, you'll come up and give us the grand prize winner, right? Okay, that's how we're going to do it. Everyone feel okay about that? So when I call your name, why don't you come up? You're going to get the trophy. I wanted those big checks, but apparently that's not how it works. Okay. I always wanted to get one of those, didn't you? Uh, okay. Our audience favorite, Tala Malik. Tala, come on up. There's Tala. The runners up, all right? No particular order. This is an impossible task, but here they are. Nevaeh Parker. <laughs> Next runner up, Sadie Anderson. The next runner-up, June Sang Ryu. Our final runner-up, Jennifer Stout. Hey, Steve, ready? Our grand prize winner. He's not white. He's not black. He's gray. <laughs> gray Idolot. All right, can we get our winners to come on up? We're going to take a couple of pictures. All right. You all are amazing, all right? You can move the world with the microphone. Keep going. Where are you gonna, you hey, come on right up here, all right? Let's go. Let's come on. Right up in front of here. Good job, everyone. You're all amazing. Come on up. Can you take a picture with us? All right, who's got the picture? Where are we going to go? Can we fit here? Second boy, this is from South Korea, that's me. Okay, okay. That's good. It, it, that's, we were talking about that. And, uh, oh. It's good. It's good. It yeah. actually worked and did what to say. It doesn't matter if it's this. Really good job. Thank you. 
job. Thank you. Give me some more.